Hi there. Welcome to Whiskey River Wood Shop. Today, being our first project, we're going to work on a small urn. There was a beloved dog named Scooter that passed away, and its owner wanted us to make a little urn for him. So I have some beautiful maple here, and we're going to cut them to size, do a little milling, a little finishing. By the end of it, it'll be a beautiful little box to hold and display the remains of that beloved pet. So the first thing on this project, I've done some doodling. Get the numbers down so we know the sizes and how much material we'll need. So, take a look here and I'll show you. Don't mind that I use my router table as a work surface. <clears throat> First I drew up on the computer some dimensions. You can see the top is 6x6. Six six. The bottom has side walls that are 5x4. Top and bottom fit. And they're a little proud. And we're going to do some routing on those. Make them pretty. With just a small space that's 35 by 35 by 4 which is what the owner said would be adequate to contain its, the dog's ashes. So I've got these two nice pieces of maple that, I don't know if you can see, I've already marked out some lines for cutting just to get us close. Um, I'm cutting everything about a quarter of an inch larger than it needs to be. That gives us a little room to clean things up and if we get some blowout we have something to cut away to clean it up. Next step, I'm going to set up the table saw and we're going to get these down to size. Here at the table saw, you can see I've gotten out my Creed precision miter gauge. One of the few more expensive tools that I've bought, and yes I consider $150 tool expensive. Sometimes you need accuracy and this was a good buy at the time for what I needed it. I wouldn't trade this for the world, although a, miter, a, a cross cut sled or a miter sled may have been a better option in the long run. However, this thing works like a champ. Um, my table saw is nothing fancy. Pick this one up at Menards, that's my local big box store, for a few hundred dollars. And what I really like about it is the cammed fence. Um, other low dollar saws that I had in the past that had a fence that only locked on one side, they were so grossly inaccurate they wouldn't keep their position for nothing. So the, uh, the gear driven fence is perfect for my needs. Now, the first thing we need to do, figure out our blade height. So I'm just going to set a piece of wood and get my blade height so that the teeth just come and I try to split the valley of the blade and that's where I want it. Alright, now we're going to be cross cutting and I know my distance in here at least pretty close and I can kind of eyeball it just to split the line since they're a little oversized anyway. I'm not going to use a stop on this so that can stay out there out of the way and I'm going to set my fence so the piece can ride along the fence. And that's locked in. Now I'll fire up the saw, adjust the fence as I need so I'm hitting those lines and my cross cuts are done. One of you folks out there could have mentioned I was just about to cross cut my gauge. So we're just going to dial that back a little bit just to make sure we're on the safe side. Normally you'd always want to keep the guard on a saw. Personally, I think you could see what I'm doing better without it, but in reality, <clears throat> I kind of live dangerous that way. I like to see what I'm doing. It gets in the way. 
I'd always keep this little bugger in there to prevent kickback, but as far as having a gauge cover the whole blade, I pay attention to where my hands are and cross my fingers. I know a lot of you two do too. Now I know somebody's gonna comment about me reaching across. No, it's not good practice. You, you're just gonna have to cope with watching somebody live on the edge a little bit. Yes, I know there's better ways to do things, but this is a very functional way for me to do things. See, I've got my four pieces that are kind of the same size, but they're all a little oversized. So, yeah, little burn, that's okay. That'll get trimmed by. That's why we cut them too wide to begin with. Now we're going to cross cut our larger board. Alright, as you can see, we can't get our crosscut sled to fit in there with the board being far enough back to cut it. Now I know that I only need six inches, six and a quarter. I got another little bit there. So we know we got a straight edge over here. We're going to account for that. We're going to dial this back. I put a little line on there so I kind of know where to where to go to, and I'm going to miss that line by quite a bit. Miss it by half an inch. Give me some extra. I've got a defect on the other side of this board, so I'm going to just take a little bit off of that too. And About right there will probably work. Let's let's just see where we're at. Yeah, that'll be just about right. And now we got a couple cross cuts to make yet. Our miter gauge should be able to clear now. Look at that. Wonderful. So, we'll just line this up. And I think in this distance it's getting narrow, so I'm going to keep my push stick handy. I think I'm even going to use this just as a little bit of hold down. I try to always wait for the saw to come to a stop before I do a whole lot of maneuvering, especially when it comes time to move the fence. I think hitting a hitting a fence with the saw blade is a Big no no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're pretty close right there. Hmm. 
remember that when you're doing woodworking, sometimes slow is fast. Sometimes taking time to just look at things before you start pushing wood through the saw allows you to see little things that would help your progress out a lot. So now we've got our saw set up so that we can make our rip cuts. We've got our four pieces. The distance is set to exactly what I need them to be before they get beveled. So I'm going to go ahead and make those four cuts and we'll get rid of all that terrible right there. So now with our four side pieces, <clears throat> cut to width the way we want them. All the grain will be upright in the box. And with our lid and base roughly cut to size, we can move on to our next step. We gotta decide which one of these pieces we want to be the top and which side would look best as the top facing up. And I'm thinking, I think this one. I think this one would look best. Just like that, we're going to have a name and some dates that we're going to mill into the top of this. Yeah, that should work. So, I'm going to find my pencil. Small messy shop, you lose your pencil every time you set it down. And I'm going to mark our center on this piece by just going corner to corner and corner to corner. There, now we know where our center is. Our mill is going to need that center location so it knows where to center the pattern. And this one will only be seen from the bottom. So I think I'm going to use this side as the actual bottom. So I'm going to write bottom on that. This one I know will be the top and which way because there's going to be a carving in it. For our sides, <clears throat> we know all our grain is going to be standing upright. And there's going to be some beveling involved. So I kind of want to arrange them so I think on all of them I'm going to favor the left side and get the dark patch in the grain to kind of center the piece. I think that'll work out nicely. So now we're at the mill. I understand that most people don't have one of these in their shop. I built this one with no experience on about $3,000 worth of parts. I could probably do it again on about $2,000 worth of parts and build a better machine doing it. There's a lot of information out there on building a mill for your shop. Uh, you don't need to go buy a factory built mill. Um, I mean, if you want the ease of just roll it off the truck, plug it in, go, then yeah, you gotta buy the factory mill. But a, a, a little study, a little practice, and you can have a perfectly functioning machine on a fraction of what it would cost you to buy those factory built jobs. Now the next step in our project was we're going to mill some writing into the top of our urn. So I'm going to set this into the machine, square it up, clamp it down, set our center. Um, well you probably can't see it very well but 
we'll put a little X in the middle. Yeah, you still can't see the X, can you? Anyway, there's an X there. You just have to trust me. And we're going to get this nice and squared up to the mill, clamp down, set our center, set our Z, our Z height right at the surface, load up our file, and set it to cutting. So I use this just to offset it from the edge a little bit so the, <clears throat> so the head doesn't have to get quite so close. I've already taken a square and verified that all my corners are in fact nice and square. So I've got little holes all over the table this, and there's threaded inserts in them where I just snug up some wooden pieces that a bolt goes through just until they start to flex a little bit that I know they're holding. And uh, use some washers to get my depth right on them. Let's see what I got going on here, and then we'll adjust as necessary. Yeah, this is the boring part. We'll get to the good part in a minute. So, I think I can probably get away with just three clamps instead of four. Usually I'll use one at each corner, but yeah, line it up real good on this one. My holes are about two inches apart, and sometimes I can't quite find an adequate place to clamp it down where I can get good contact. The last thing we want is this thing to come sailing around while the machine's running. Everything's nice and snug. Get it close, and we use our handheld to adjust the rest of the way. And sometimes it's easy enough just to see with the eye where your Z depth should be. So we've got our piece mounted, our zeros are located. We'll load up the file that I just made when I went inside and warmed up for an hour because yes it's still cold out here. All right, that's all loaded up. So I've zoomed in for you a little bit so that you can see what's going on. We brought our bit up to 18,000 RPM, and now I'm gonna tell it to go ahead and do the cut, sit back and enjoy.
So now we'll just take the piece off the middle, take a closer look at it, see how it turned out. Not too bad. The best little dog. It was a good little dog. Well, this ain't too bad. I'll, I'll get in there and do a little sanding. So next we'll be cutting our boards to width, the, the side boards. Um, we want to make sure they're all exactly where we need them to be before we get around to cutting the bevels. And I used to have a ruler. There it is. <clears throat> The joys of not having enough space. We know according to our initial sheet that we want these to be five inches wide. So we're going to use a ruler and set our fence so that we are right at the five inch mark. And we have our pieces. All right, they're pretty close, so we're just going to take a little bit off of each one. Now we're going to set our table saw up <coughs> to four inches for the height. And with that set, Them the other direction. <clears throat> Remember, always let your saw stop spinning before you reach in there to get the debris out of the way. So, the next step we'll be working at here at the table saw is to put a bevel on each side. So the first thing I'm going to do is get this fence out of the way and then we're going to crank the blade up all the way so we can accurately measure it. And now we want to adjust our bevel and we're not shooting for exactly 45. Ideally we want 45.1. Yeah, I know. That kind of accuracy in woodworking is hard to achieve. However, I do have a gauge around here somewhere to measure with. I set it down somewhere. Now you just got to find it. So this is the joy of working in a shop where you don't have enough space. You set things down and you can never find them again. Ah, oh, there it is, right in front of me. So, I'm going to use this and look on that side and lock it in right there. Alright, now the first side will run across, uh, across the fence, looking so that uh, the goal is we just want to touch that edge. Now at this point we have to figure out which side is which. Sometimes it helps get your eye down there and take a close look at it and we're gonna cut what I think to be a little short. I can always make another pass so we'll just test it out with this one. And we want to adjust our blade height before we get going. 
We don't need the blade sticking through that far. It's just gonna cause problems. And right about there should be okay. Get that out of the way. Well, I can see after the first cut, we want it just a tiny little bit more. So I'm going to use the ruler here and make one little adjustment. We'll try it again. Right, we do want to make another tiny little adjustment and give them all one more pass on the first bevel. And with the first side beveled, now we're going to rotate them and set up to cut the other side, which should be right where we want it to be. It's, it's pretty darn close there, so we're going to leave it where it is and make our first cut, take a look, adjust if we need to. There, with our debris out of the way, <clears throat> now we can examine these pieces and see how they pair up. Now we're going to have to decide what's front and back, what's side and side because the front and back need to be exactly the same length. Good. Side and side need to be exactly the same length. That'll do. These actually came out really nice. There's a little bit of tool marking on them, but I don't, I don't think that it's enough to really get in the way. I'm going to take a pencil, if I can find one, and mark them right, left, front, back. I don't write with too hard with the pencil. The last thing I want to do is leave an impression in the wood that requires more sanding to get it out and then end up with a slight divot in the sanding. Try to avoid that at all costs. So, looking at front and the back, left and right, I'm just going to kind of use a table saw to just kind of squish them together a little bit, see how we're doing. I think we're going to... We might have to flip something around here a little bit. I think once we get a band clamp around that, it's going to come together nicely. should work just fine. So these pieces are ready to go inside the house because it's too cold for glue to set out here. It'll freeze before it sets. And get the band clamp around them. Get them glued up. So down here in the finishing room, and down here meaning the basement of the house, because it's too cold to glue anything out in the garage, I've got the four pieces laid out. Front, back, left, and right, of course. <clears throat> orientated in a way that they that all the bevels come together nicely. I've got two band clamps that are appropriately adjusted for this job. My tight bond 3 glue which I tend to use for everything even if it doesn't need to be waterproof or outside or I, I just find good results with tight bond 3. No they're not paying me to say it I just like their product. And I've got some paper towels handy because gluing's always a mess. <clears throat> and here we go. So one thing I should have done before I started this 
is I should have put some tape on the inside of those bevels so that when the squeeze out happens and I end up with glue to clean up, it saves me lots of effort trying to get down into those corners cleaning up the inside. Well, the outside's easy because you get a sander at the outside. The inside, it's all do it by hand the hard way. So there we go. It's glued up, clamped up, glue wiped away, and now we just wait. So now we're back again at the table saw. We want to make sure our top and bottom are exactly six inches by six inches. This piece is a little trickier because we have a carving in it, so we gotta make sure we center what we take off, which is a good thing because I, I cut everything a little oversized and then come back and just nip the edges of it to clean it up. That way we get rid of those burn marks. Makes life a little easier on us. Now, I've measured this and it comes out to just a little eighth of an inch over six. So we want to take a sixteenth off of each side. So I'm going to set my fence Just take a sixteenth, and yes, sometimes it's good just set the ruler back down for a second and look at it one more time, just to make sure everything's okay. All right, now part of the reason that we always do our cross cuts before our rip cuts is I don't know if you can see on the corner we had that tiny little bit of blowout. Let's see, right there. I don't know if you'd see that. Well, now when we come back and do a rip cut, that part's going to get cut away. And we're going to make just an ever so slight adjustment. There we go. So I know on this side, I want to center what I cut off also. So I can see I'm about 7 eighths and I'm, a, I'm about, okay, I can, I can take a little more off of the bottom than I can the top. And since I cut, well, maybe not if I'm measuring from the right spot. Okay, they're, they're right about the same. So, I'm looking at needing to remove three quarters of an inch, so I want three eighths off of each side. So I'm going to set my first cut to six and three eighths. That's straight. I don't know what was going on there. All right. Always waiting for the saw to stop before you stick your fingers in. Now, we're going to set our final cut right to the six inch mark. So we're going to make the last cut on this one, and we're going to make all four cuts on the other one. Well, I guess all two cuts on the other one. And now measuring this out, it should be exactly six by six, just what we want. <clears throat> so the bottom, we only need to make two cuts since my edges all look okay. Now 
we are exactly where we want it to be. Next step, router table. So over here at the router table, I've cleaned it up, changed our bit to an OG, and we want to put that OG into the profile of the base. <clears throat> now the base is the part that's actually getting screwed on. The top will be glued on so that the screws aren't visible to people looking at it. And I would like to make a little recess down at the bottom so it looks like it kind of has feet. And I would like a little bit of a recess at the top so that so the bottom kind so it kind of settles into place so the screws line up. So <clears throat> I gotta pick which side I want down. So I think I'll have that side down. And then I'm going to kind of eyeball as I adjust the height and try to determine where I would prefer my OG to be. And <clears throat> I don't want to get it too too far. I think so if I'm just coming into it about an eighth of an inch on the bottom, then I'll have my profile and that should leave me about a quarter of an inch on the on the the top so I can make that little recession into it. But I don't want to go too far there either, or the material will get too thin once I cut that recession in. So I'm happy with it right where it's at. I'm gonna lock my router in place. Keep everything out of the way. Now I'm going to move my fence up. It's not too stuck. Because I don't want to actually go a full depth of pass the first time through. So I'm going to find a happy spot. Fence is kind of lined up. Secure that down, and then I can just back off the fine tuning until I'm about three quarters of the way through. Using a straight edge ruler, you can get a better feel. Okay, I want to leave just a little bit to take off on the last pass. <clears throat> that way I can move through quicker and remove any burn marks that are caused from the first pass where I'm taking off more material. And because this bit has a bearing, I don't really need both sides of the fence. I, I get the second side back a little bit because I'm not really, you know, you don't want to as you're pushing something through, you don't want to hook it. So I want to make sure that that's, you know, when I'm applying some pressure, that that's going to clear. It only needs to clear by 30 seconds, but it's got to clear. All right. There's that. So I'm going to route this side. And I'm going to do all four edges. Of course, cross cuts before rip cuts. And we're going to do the top. Um, you know, I'm really hoping I didn't get too close there. Maybe I took off just a hair too much, and that's the width I want it, but where that carve sits. I'll compare the two. I might want to modify the OG that I put on this once I see what the bottom one's going to end up looking like. Thank you for watching part one of Scooter's Urn here on Whiskey River Woodshop. Part two will be out soon. Subscribe, follow, 
like us, we really, really appreciate it. Thank you.